Hey y'all, I uh, hope the homework made sense. Today we're going to be going over World War I to World War II, which is happening at the same time as like the 1920s and the Great Depression. Um, so keep that in mind as we go through. This is the foreign policy part. So reviewing uh, World War I, it's important to remember that the United States is neutral, but not isolationist. They kind of mean the same thing, but they are different. So neutral means we are not we are not engaged in these alliances, right? If you remember, Europe was lined up on two sides. And we are heeding, you know, George Washington's advice that goes all the way back to the founding of the nation, that the, the United States should not get involved in any entangling alliances. But the reason why I say we are not isolationist is we are involved in all of these other things. We are engaging with our military. Um, we talked a lot about, um, you know, we are becoming the police of the world. We are engaged, especially in America. We are engaging in nationalism with, you know, yellow journalism and we're jingoistic. We are engaging in imperialism. And so while we don't care about the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, we um, are out there in the world. And so by 1917 in World War I, we are getting involved somewhat because of submarine warfare, but also because of the Zimmerman telegram. Those are the two big ones to remember. Um, so we are neutral, but we are not isolationist. And again, we have the Philippines is here. This is going to be important to remember. You know, we have Hawaii. We have all of these things out here. The United States is, you know, involved. It is out there. So Wilson gets involved in World War I in 1917. He says he's doing it to make the world safe for democracy. Um, and after the war, um, people are, you know, rightfully, um, you know, this is a horrible war. We never want to have it happen again. This is that trench warfare that we talked about that just went on forever. And so at the end of the war, we are trying to you know, prevent anything like this from ever happening again. And so Wilson has this like progressive vision. Um, you could call it internationalism, you could call it cooperation. But his idea is that the United States should take a role in the world, it should be out there, it should be trying to create peace. Um, this is this idea of peace, we want economic free trade. Um, during the seas. If you remember, the reason why we got involved is because, you know, our ships were being bombed by the submarines. Uh, we want to decrease armaments or, you know, we want to demilitarize. We want to adjust colonial claims. We want to be anti-imperialist, right? And so this cooperative vision of the world is anchored in the 14th point of his 14 points is uh, the creation of a League of Nations. And so what he wants is the world to work together. Um, and, you know, this sounds good to Germany. Germany is going to surrender. Uh, and, you know, they said, okay, let's go to the peace table. Wilson says he wants to do these 14 points. That doesn't seem too bad. So the problem, though, is that in the actual Treaty of Versailles, Germany is going to be punished. And... Um, this is, you know, the war guilt clause. And the only thing that Wilson really gets of his 14 points is the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is called Article 10 of the Treaty of Versailles, um, which sometimes people talk, if you're reading speeches, some people talk about Article 10. So it's important to remember that. Um, so, uh, Wilson is... Um, yeah, so Wilson is the president. He's trying to get the treaty passed. He went and negotiated the treaty. He brought it back to the United States. Congress has to accept the treaty, and Congress does not accept the treaty. They are like, why did you go out there? Why did you agree to this League of Nations and, or Article 10? Henry Cabot Lodge is probably the biggest um, advocate of isolationism. He says we could not directly be controlled by a league at any time. Um, so Congress does not accept the treaty. This is our first step towards, you know, isolationism after World War I. Um, 
A side note is, uh, right before the end of World War One, communism is going to um, emerge in the Russian Revolution. So Russia, in the, the communist revolution, this is a totalitarian state, um, and communism is another ism. So the United States is going into isolationism. Uh, Russia is going to communism, and this is a totalitarian state, and it is appealing to class. It is appealing to workers. Whenever you see communism as an ideology, you're going to see something about the bourgeoisie, um, you know, the bourgeoisie here. Uh, these are the capitalists. And so communism sees it as the workers versus the capitalists. And their appeal is to the workers, right? So communism rises up in the Soviet, in the Russia, and they are appealing to the workers. In the United States, the United States is returning to isolationism and nativism, which is anti-immigrant. Some of that has to do with, um, you know, anti-communist feeling in the United States. There is a red scare after World War I, uh, mainly targeted at immigrants, um, as people are afraid of the rise of communism here. Unions actually are going to be targeted in this as well. And this is called, uh, we have race riots, we talked about last time, and this first Red Scare, and an increase in nativism. So, <clears throat> as we have, after World War One, Harding, this is his return to normalcy. We are not signing the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and we are retreating into, like, anti-immigrant and other ideas. Um, fascism is taking hold in Europe. Fascism is an appeal to nationalism, uh, the party platform in 1920 um, is looking at uniting all Germans for Germany, right, under a greater Germany. So here, he's not appealing to class. He is appealing to nationality. Germans for Germanies for Germans, right? All editors must be Germans. And positive Christianity, right? Not the Jewish materialistic spirit. So fascism is this idea that like uniting together, um, and the reason why this is a, some people say it's appealing to many folks is because of the Great Depression, which is taking hold in Germany um, at this time. So Hitler is rising to power on fascism. Germany for Greater Germany for Germany. So. Just to kind of as a side note, you know, another ism that both of them are, a lot of people are like, well, what is the difference between communism and fascism? And really it is that appeal to either, are you appealing to workers and trying to unite as a class, or are you appealing to your country and trying to unite people as a nation, which is fascism. Um, so those are really the two differences, but they are both totalitarian. So totalitarianism is just this idea that, you know, the country has total control, right? Total control. So totalitarianism is total control, which means you have no, or very few freedoms as a citizen. So like in fascism, you're going to have, I guess, more freedoms if you are, you know, German. But, um, what happens under totalitarianism is you get to target enemies of the state. So anyone who does not agree with you in a totalitarian government, they can eliminate folks. So, you know, Stalin is going to uh, be a dictator and Hitler is essentially a dictator. Both of them are killing millions and millions and millions of people. So this is the... Um, thing. And keep this in mind, you know, 7 million Soviets are going to die <coughs> in this war as we kind of like look at the end of this. I'm going to go through this and then we'll take a look at the war itself. And so this is, you know, we have the rise of fascism, totalitarianism, uh, communism in Europe. And all during this time, the United States is focusing on itself, focusing on neutrality and isolationism. Um, 
Nye is another senator. He is was tasked with investigating why did we get into World War I. And sort of like the idea with investigating why we got into World War I is so that we never do it again. Um, and so when he does this, when he investigates why we went into World War I, he is essentially going to find out that um, it is because of munitions and contraband and profits. Um, this is, I believe, that the only hope of staying out of war is through our people recognizing and declaring a matter of national policy that we do not ship munitions, aid, or any other combatants to people at war. So this is called the Merchants of Death thesis. That the reason why we went to war is because of bankers and arms dealers. Um, so the neutrality acts are going to be passed in 1935. While Hitler is rising to power, the United States is saying we are not going to sell anything to people who are at war. No loans, no armaments, um, and we are not going to do this. We got into World War I because we were shipping uh, guns to Europe. We are not going to do it again. So um, this is isolationism. Neutrality acts are the really big thing to remember. No trade with countries at war. So the other thing that we're doing, uh, we saw this with the KKK article, is that push for pure Americanism during World War I. Uh, we are going to pass our first immigration restrictions, which include literacy tests. And this quota system, which is going to limit people from um, certain countries from coming in, we are going to be limiting it from uh, places like Russia, Poland, our new immigrants, Italy. Um, some of this is because of the Red Scare. And we also already have our Chinese Exclusion Act from 1890. Um, so again, nativism is a big thing. So we are, right, as Hitler is rising to power, he is... Um, you know, targeting Jewish folks. In 1938, you have Kristallnacht in Germany where they're torching synagogues. Uh, people are moving to ghettos. Um, and eventually, you're going to have the final solution, which is genocide and uh, killing squads. There is a question about how much the United States knew about, um, you know, the camps. So I think you could question... You know, did we know about these extermination camps? And I will say this about it. You know, concentration camps have been used a lot. Um, you know, you can think about the United States. It's, it's come to mean the Holocaust now, but before we would call, like, you know, um, some of our Native American policy could be considered, like, concentration camps. You're putting people in certain areas. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that people say is that we did not know that those camps were extermination camps, what we know them to be today. But what we, what we definitely knew is that people are being relocated. We definitely knew that people's homes are being torched. We definitely knew that, you know, the rhetoric of uh, Nazi Germany. And what are we doing about it? Uh, not much, right? And when I say not much, we are actually um, forcing people back to Europe because of our anti-immigrant ideas. And we are also spreading even, um, you know, anti-Semitic things in the United States as well. One of the things is like America first. Um, this is isolationism. This is uh, Lindbergh is a, uh, the advocate of this. And he's basically saying we need to not get involved in war. We need to make America safe for democracy. We need to focus on ourselves. As Europe is heating up in war, people are saying that this is like a Jewish conspiracy. They are great. They are great danger. So not only is America not helping, but a lot of people are using anti-Semitic um, reasons to stay out of the war. Uh, I don't know. Side note: there is a HBO documentary right now on. Um, I don't know. I put a link there, and there's more about America First if you wanted to take a look. Um, so while many people and senators are advocating isolationism, 
slowly FDR is trying to advocate for interventionism. He is trying to advocate for war. And if not war, at least to help um, aid the Allies. And so in 1941, he is going to uh, say the Four Freedom Speech, which he is going to say we need to give aid. He's not even talking about war. He is talking about support. Um, so he is saying that we need to have these four freedoms. Um, first is freedom of speech and expression. So if you look at things in Nazi Germany, uh, the limitation of speech, worship God in every way, uh, freedom from want, um, healthy peacetime for its inhabitants, and freedom from fear. And I think this is really, you know, kind of going after that totalitarianism of Hitler you know, trying to say we need to fight for a limited government, we need to, to start, you know, ad helping the allies because they are standing for um, these freedoms. And we are going to kind of go over that later, right? So FDR wants interventionism. He wants us to be an arsenal of democracy. Um, America is officially neutral as the European war began. And he's slowly going to be increasing military production. He's skirting around the Neutrality Acts. And he's going to run for a third term. Um, and he's going to pass the Lend-Lease Act. Now, the Lend-Lease Act goes against the Neutrality Acts. And it basically says, we are going to lend um, Europe arms, which I don't know how you do that. Um, and, yeah, we will get land in, in the trade. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to embargo oil and scrap iron sales to Japan. So to Japan, who is a small country, they see this as a major kind of act of war. Um, so this is going to be the lead up to Pearl Harbor, is that we embargo them and then they attack us. <coughs> um, so FDR is moving towards war by signing the Lend-Lease Act and embargoing Japan. Um, why is this on there like three times? Anyway, uh, let's keep going. So the final solution, we took a look at that before. What do we do in return is we um, don't do anything. So we find one Nazi spy on one boat of Jewish um, Holocaust refugees and we turn the boat away. We turn away 937 passengers um, and we are restricting... Im uh, Jewish immigrants during the war as they are fleeing from uh, these atrocities. After World War II, we are going to take in uh, Jewish refugees. One of the um, oral histories that you could take a look at is um, about someone who came to New Orleans as a refugee. Um, but before that, we do not do anything. Okay, we're going to see how this goes. Can we do it? Uh, let's see if it works. See if this works. All right, let's see if it works. Okay. So I totally stole this from, I don't know, whatever this place is, the, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so I don't take any, um, supposed to be animated. Ah, oh, it doesn't work. Okay. Here is, uh, oh God. This doesn't work. Okay. It doesn't work on this app. Anyway, I'll see if I can, um, you know. I'll post this up because it's kind of cool, but it doesn't work on this device. Anyway, one thing I want you guys to know is that uh, Russia is on our side. So when the United States enters the war, they're going to enter after Pearl Harbor. So after Pearl Harbor, even the America First people are going to be like, hey, you know, we got to go to war. Once we're attacked, virtually everybody is like, yes, we are going to war. This is not World War One where we have to convince people to go to war. This is, um, you know, they attacked us. So we're going to go to war after Pearl Harbor. Um, but you have to imagine that when we go to war, 
the entirety of Europe is taken over. So as Germany is spreading out um, all over the nation, the United States is doing nothing. Now, the other thing is, even though France is down, you know, Great Britain is with us, the other ally that we have during World War II is the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is going to lose like 7 million or like 10 million people. I should look it up. But anyway, um, and it is a lot of people. So the Soviet Union is coming from the east and we are coming from the west and we are going to be kind of squeezing in Germany. We like to use air power. We are going to be bombing Germany um, over and over and over again. Uh, the bombing of Dresden is terrible. Um, the Russians, meanwhile, are just sending in millions and millions of people. So we are kind of slowly coming in, and after the war, we are going to be dividing it up with the Soviet Union. That being said, you know, as we are considering the fact that we are going to war, you know, because of, like, freedom from want, freedom from fear, um, the Soviet Union is a totalitarian state. So when we get to the Cold War afterwards, you know, we have to kind of reckon with that. So December 7th, 1941, this is what gets us into the war. You know, it is not all of these other things. It is Pearl Harbor. And then when we get into the war, though, we focus on Europe first um, with our allies, the Soviet Union. All right, that is it for homework. I'm going to have you guys look up a, there's a, there's a short answer question, and there's a, another oral history to listen to. Um, and that is that. All right, thanks.